Hello, Agora Bible Fellowship. Well, my name is Adrienne Kegel, and I've got a couple of announcements for you. I am the Children's and Women's Ministry Director here at ABF. And man, if you are not plugged in on our local community, we would love to serve you. We have so many things going on during the week. We would just love for you to be a part of all the programs, whether you're a child or you're a senior saint, we've got something for you. Well, um, one of the ways that we love to serve you is through our prayer ministry. And throughout the week, anytime, day or night, you are welcome to text us at 97000. And that's just a simple way for you to share your confidential prayer requests with us. And we will be praying for you. So please go ahead and text us at any time. Well, um, Last thing is, as, as all of you know, we are a nonprofit organization, and the way that we are supported is through your generous gifts. And so we would be honored if you would partner with us, if you'd prayerfully consider uh, giving us a financial donation. And it's easy and simple. You can go onto our website and hit the Give tab. It's a, it's a great way, an easy way for you to join us as we minister here in Agora Hills and around the world. So thank you for that. Before we jump into God's word, I would just love to pray for you before we begin. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for every person as is joining us right now. And Lord, you know all the details going on in their lives. You know their joys and their pains. And so Lord, I pray that you would meet them exactly where they're at. And God, this uh, message would just uh, speak to them directly from you and minister to their hearts. God, we love you and we put the spotlight on you today. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, greetings, online church family. Thank you, Adrian. Good to be with you. Just coming to you live from basically underwater here. We've been having a camp uh, at our church all week uh, for the kiddos. And man, what a joy it's been just seeing just a ton of kids running around every day, hearing Bible stories, singing praises, just seeing uh, God just doing a, a work in kids' life has been such a, a powerful thing. A special thanks to everybody that's been a part of making uh, that possible. Even today in our, our response to the gospel, we just had so many kids making decisions. And sometimes we're not sure because you're like, well, I'm pretty sure he made that decision last year as well. But either way, getting rooted and grounded in the gospel and making decisions that I believe are going to impact them for a lifetime. And so excited to be coming out of uh, Camp Week. Well, we're just finishing up this series that we've been in called Inspired, and that's been working through Jesus' words, his, probably his very most famous uh, sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, and the section that we've been going through is a specific section called the Beatitudes, where he starts his sermon and he goes to, through a, a list of different attitudes or uh, characteristics of a believer that should be evidence of a believer and what is making them blessed, the blessed meaning happy or, or satisfied. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. But basically the things that Jesus has, su has suggested as sources of happiness or the root of it wouldn't at all align with what our culture would suggest. We don't usually associate uh, happiness with humility, mourning over your sin, being meek, Pursuing righteousness, extending mercy to others, having a pure, clean heart, being a peacemaker. Jesus suggests all kinds of things that don't necessarily align with the cultural norm. And this week, probably, I know I say it, I've said it weeks before, but this week really doesn't align with the cultural norm because he says that the thing that's going to make you happy, blessed are those who are persecuted. You're like, wait a second, those who are persecuted, happy are the harassed? What does that even mean? Those that go, th go through hardship because of their own beliefs, you wouldn't necessarily associate that with uh, any kind of happiness or satisfaction. But here's the, the idea that he points to, is that this is key. It's part of the believer's life, part of the experience. And we're so programmed in our culture to be uh, discomfort uh, uh, or avoid discomfort at all, uh, whatever it takes to avoid it. We're, we want to try to create a, a cocoon that we exist in and avoid it as much as possible. And really, we instituted uh, really a, a life or an existence that avoids it for ourselves. And we do our best 
to avoid any kind of uh, discomfort for those we care about most. So Jesus is really upending this idea when he's suggesting that it should be part of the norm, part of the expectation for those who are committed followers of Jesus Christ. If we're honest, present day, we'd be, really, we'd stand out like a sore thumb in comparison to some of the descriptions of what the early believers went through. Hebrews 11.35 describes it to a bit. It says, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered, mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. He goes on from there with this just description of just the hardship and pain that so many of our predecessors have experienced. So the question is, what does it look like as we live in a, basically a country that's known for its religious freedom, where we don't encounter that level of persecution? What should we expect? What should we count on to experience as a follower of Jesus Christ in the present day, in the modern era? Let me pray before we explore the answers to those questions. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this opportunity to spend just exploring your word and literally the, your words, a sermon that you taught. God, it's so rich and just full of uh, direction, direction that we don't stumble upon, not direction that our, our world suggests, but direction as to what a satisfied and full life looks like. God, I pray that we'd really pique our, our interest, that we'd lean in and listen intently for what you want to say to us. We invite that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, starting in the uh, verse 10, we're just going to cover the last couple verses of this section, verse 10 through 12. It star he starts by saying this. He starts by saying, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Now, let's be clear on that. We've talked the entire series about the blessing part, and that's hopefully kind of sinking in. That's the idea of being happy or satisfied or fulfilled or complete, somebody that's not lacking anything. So he's promising that as part of our experience is the, to, to, to be blessed if we experience these things. And the, the thing that I've already alluded to is what he points to is persecution. Those who are persecuted. Now you might say, well, how is that relevant today? Well, here's the thing that you have to wrestle through. Just because it might not be relevant to you personally, it might not be relevant to me personally, based on our, my living circumstances, where we're placed, doesn't mean that persecution isn't part of the present day experience of so many on our planet. Doing a, a little research on that even this week, just the existence and how prevalent persecution is right now. There's two organizations, Voice of the Martyr and Open Door uh, Ministry, that track persecution around the, the world. Basically, the idea is this, that there's literally thousands of people every single year that you lose their life in the name of Jesus Christ. There's a research group by the name of Reuters that actually has determined that approximately 100 million believers are currently living under some level of persecution. Other organizations would suggest that Christians are the very most persecuted group of any religious group on the planet. So it's not as if we're not experiencing it. It's a, it's a prevalent thing. In fact, the top nations, and I mention these so we can be praying for the, the top nations where persecution is presently taking place would be North Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Somalia Iran, Syria, Pakistan, Sudan. These are places where uh, proclaiming the, the name of Jesus Christ comes at a price. Literally the, the risk of, of physical harm and potentially even death. So it's not something that's absent of the 20th century, in fact, 21st century. In fact, the, there's a, it's estimated that more Christians were martyred in the 20th century than every century previously combined. 
So I know there's population growth, I get that, but either way, persecution is still prevalent. So when he's saying this, he's understanding that that should be, uh, shouldn't be a shocker for those who choose to follow Jesus Christ. And why would they be per persecuted? He says right there, for righteousness' sake. For, in other words, choosing to do the right thing. Saying the right thing. Standing up for the right thing. It doesn't say persecuted for being silly or stupid or self-righteous or being a jerk or speaking your mind or doing foolish things or breaking the law. We have to be really clear on what, what qualifies er of, as persecution. It's not just because you're going through something difficult that you're being persecuted because of your faith. But we do understand that if righteousness is an aim, if that's a goal, that will be part of your experience most likely. If you think about it, the entire uh, teaching that we've had on the Beatitudes really centers around us. The main theme of the Beatitudes, the first two, have to do with recognizing your own unrighteousness. Then the next five have to do with our seeking and reflecting righteousness in our life. And this very last one is to clarify what expectations, what happens to you when that's the pursuit, when that's the aim of your life. It's really one of the clear hallmarks, if you will, of a blessed life is righteousness. But here's what he's explaining to us. If you hold biblical, hold to biblical standards, you're going to collide with the world. Why? Because if you think about it, righteousness attracts persecution. We are at odds with the value system of the world around us. And so what should we expect from that? What I love is that it brings us to a promise of what's going to take place. And the promise is a positive one. He promises that theirs, in other words, those who are persecuted, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the, the dangling carrot, the ultimate promise, if you will, that there's something on the other side of this. This 70, 80, 100 years that you have here is just a drop in the bucket of our existence. And he's saying, for those who endure, for those who choose to pursue righteousness in the name of Jesus Christ, for those who are followers, he's saying, you are going to experience on the other side of this ever, an everlasting kingdom. And here's the thing that's important to understand, is there's going to be people, people that are part of that everlasting kingdom and people that are excluded from that everlasting kingdom. In fact, Scripture is very clear that the alternate option is to spend eternity separated from God in torment, in hell. We want to avoid talking about that, but that's the reality of what Scripture repeatedly points to. And one of the reasons why it's so important to talk about persecution is persecution is often the means to expose who's genuinely in, who's a, a, a true, genuine follower of Jesus Christ. They've been chosen to give their life to him regardless of what that, what that cost includes. That's what, how, how it comes to the surface, who is actually in and who's actually not. When personal harm is a potential, you see the, authentic, the authenticity of somebody's faith. If you think about it, that's one of the arguments that you'd make for even the early believers. Think about the argument that you'd make for the authenticity of the faith of the early believers. Every single one of the disciples, except for Judas, has, uh, who betrayed Jesus, the remainder of the 11 disciples, every single one of them died because of their faith. Church history points to just some of the miserable things uh, that they experience. If you think about well, Paul being beheaded, Peter being crucified upside down because he didn't feel uh, worthy to die in the same way as Jesus Christ. The only one that some suggest didn't die of persecution was John himself who died of natural causes. But if you think about what he went through, he, they actually tried to boil him alive. Then they sent him to Patmos to work in a labor mine. And so he definitely experienced persecution, exposing the authenticity of his faith. Andrew was also crucified. It's believed that uh, Matthew was stabbed to death. Every single one of them, their martyrdom exposed and uh, validated the authenticity 
of the message that they were proclaiming, a risen Christ that they were following. Now, compare and contrast that to other belief systems. It was interesting this week, kind of reading and thinking about Joseph Smith, who's known for starting the Mormon uh, belief system. And it's interesting because his uh, belief system was based on a vision that he had from an angel by the name o of Morini or Morani. And uh, it's interesting because when he had that vision, one of the things that allowed it to get traction for other people to be interested in following it is because he had three different witnesses that validated that he, they had seen the same vision. Vision: Martin Harris, David Whitmer, and Oliver Cowdery. Now here's the interesting thing and where there's the division, and I get to, I'll get to a point with this, between Christian, Christianity and their belief system is all three of those witnesses ultimately confessed that they had made it up, that they didn't experience that vision, and basically were thrown out of the church. L listening, listening to Joseph Smith's words on December 16th, 1838, he says, Such characters as David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, and Martin Harris, he mentions two other names, are too mean to mention, and we had liked to have forgotten them. Basically what had happened is Martin, one of the witnesses, changed his religious affiliation 13 different times. The, the, both Whitmer and Cowdery were excommunicated from the Mormon church. Can you imagine if that was the case with Jesus' disciples? One of the validating things that happens in our life is time persecution, when you run into obstacles, what you genuinely believe is brought to the surface. When you're squeezed, the truth of what you hold to and cling to comes to the surface. So that's why he's saying you're blessed to have this opportunity. When you ha have the opportunity to have the genuineness of your faith brought to the surface, man, that's a, that's a gift. No one's left wondering as to what you're clinging to or where your hope is at. But again, coming back to us, you might say, well, Pastor Scott, I can't say that I've experienced any kind of physical persecution. I've never been drugged to prison. I've never been beat up because of my faith. And here's the thing to understand. That's not always the full picture of what Jesus describes as the expectation of persecution in the life of a believer. Let's take a look at what to expect in verse 11. It says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Let's stop there. Th just thinking through this. He's basically personalizing. He says, blessed are you. He's wanting to uh, allow the audience to say, man, when, a, when you disciples go through this, you're going to be blessed. Those who live righteously will inevit inevitably be persecuted people. Basically, holy people pay a price to experience the blessing that comes along with it. This isn't just a one-time presented. This is a reoccurring theme in Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So it's not a might, it's, it's not a could be. That's why here it says when this takes place. It's an obvious, it's an expectation. But we also, when you see the word used there, when, you also get the idea that it's not always a constant. There might be waves of persecution. You might go through a season where you're running into opposition because of your beliefs. And then there's seasons where you're like, hey, I'm not really noticing it. That's what he's mentioning. Three things, though, for us when it's coming to anticipate. And I find it interesting that out of the three, two of them for sure don't have to do with physical. Maybe potentially one. Let's take a look at the three that he mentions. They will revile you. They will persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you. The first one, let's be clear on what revile means. It means to abuse and attack with evil words. 
often we think of the physical. This is clearly, this has more to do with emotional. This has more to do with someone coming in and speaking against your character. That's basically saying things directly to you, about you, or around you. These are some of the most hurtful things when someone's actually tearing you down. Maybe uh, attacking your character and you wonder, well, why is that? Well, if you think about it, practically speaking, before you can effectively persecute someone, you first have to demonize them. So often we see that as followers of Jesus Christ. You need to be seen as intolerant. You need to be seen as difficult to work with, as, as judgmental. There's so many words that are often attached to a follower of Jesus Christ. And to some degree, that's the persecution that you experience when you have labels that are stamped, that are attached to you, that are said about you. And that's often uh, the, the persecution that we run into. It says they revile you, they persecute you. Persecute is actually a pretty broad term. It's a Greek word, dioku, which actually means to drive out, to be chased or pursued. It really falls into a broad category of really any mistreatment or ridicule because of your faith. And that can come in the form of physical. It can also come in the form, as we mentioned, emotional. It might be a harassment. It might be being mocked. It might be being made fun of. The last one, again, doesn't have to do with being drugged off by the police, but it says utter all kinds of evil against you. These are serious insults, abusive words. They're mocking you, being vicious. This is, there's a, a difference, though, between this and the word that's used to revile you. The difference here is that when it's being spoken against you, it's often something that's said behind your back. You don't have the opportunity to defend yourself. That's where they're speaking dishonest things about you that are planting seeds of, of, of distrust, that are planting seeds of, whoa, I don't know about that guy. He's this or he's that. That's the way that the enemy works often behind the scenes with really all kinds of evil that are being said against you. And here's the thing that you have to understand that are being said falsely about you. Whether it's something that's being made up, whether it's a false accusation, either way, it's not something that's accurate. So those are three different things that he highlights. And here's the, the idea is that's the, the reason behind it is captured right at the end of that verse. And I think it's so important for us to catch that. You're falsely, all these things, falsely on my account, on my account. Because sometimes you might be like, well, why am I going through all, all of this stuff? Here's the thing to understand. The, on my account points to the idea that he's the reason for our mistreatment. If you think about it, he explains to us, hey, they hated me. They're going to hate you if your life aligns with me. Think about Jesus' life. It was marked by, with serving others, with meeting needs, with healing, with rescuing, with, with feeding, with caring for the, the poor, all of these things. But yet, man, they just could not stand Jesus. That's why he warned his disciples in John 15. He said, if the world hates you, you know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, they're going to hate you. He explains. He says a little bit further on. He says, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. There's an irrational hatred. I don't know if you've noticed this before. There doesn't seem like there's opposition against Buddha or Muhammad or some of the other de belief systems. Joseph Smith, I've already mentioned. There's not the same level of hostility, but when someone mentions Jesus Christ, people pull back, they resist, they turn the camera off, they want to avoid that in all possible ways because there's something to be said about man exposing when people are exposed to the light, they prefer darkness rather than light. So with this growing intolerance for believers, you got to wonder if we'll see more and more persecution in our lifetime. If you think about it, anytime you're standing up for righteousness, you got to anticipate that's not going to be well received. Just thinking about that practically of what that looks like present day, often what you're standing up for what's right is so often being the one that stands in between those in power and those who are being oppressed. 
those who are, are taking advantage and those who are being taken advantage of, whether you can add to my list, but just thinking through some of those different areas, whether it's standing up for uh, women that are going through mistreatment, whether it's immigrants, whether it's kids that are being taken advantage of, whether it's the elderly, the handicapped, minorities, any level of resisting the powers that be, that's going to come with some level of persecution. Basically, if you speak for the voiceless, you're going to need to brace yourself. And probably one of the most obvious voiceless uh, people that we need to stand up for is the unborn baby. When you speak up for these things, when you step out on their expense, you have to realize you're going to be spoken poorly about you're going to be excluded, you're going to be ostracized, you're going to be rejected. All of those things should not shock us. And here, just as I'm speaking to anyone who's younger in the audience and you're wondering, man, as I'm going to college, as I'm in high school or whatever you're in, here's the thing. When you choose not to participate in the things of the world, and I know these are the churchy things, but when you choose not to smoke weed, when you choose not to drink, when you choose not to sleep around, when you choose not to watch horror films, when you choose not to listen to explicit lyrics, when you say, I'm drawing a line, people don't like that. People push away from that. Oh, what are you too good for that? Is that, is that, is that something you're looking down on us for? People would much rather see you join them in their sin and they're not going to drag you off to prison. But here's the thing. So often persecution is a lot more subtle than that. You're not included. You're not invited. You're not in the text thread. You're not, uh, you're not a part of the group. But here's the thing to understand why it's so key to be a part of a healthy, God-honoring Christian community is we're intended to be the support to each other through things like this. During waves of persecution, man, to be able to lean into a fellow believer and say, man, I'm going through this. I, can you pray for me? Can you lift me up to be able to stand firm for what is right? That's the intention of the body of Christ to be that support. So the question is, what is our response when we collide with this persecution that he's basically promised as a guarantee that it's coming? Look in verse 12. He says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All right, we'll stop there for the remainder of our, our text, just talking through that. The first word there, the original word used for rejoice actually involved the idea or picture of, of leaping for joy. There, it's not, not sulking. There's a, a physical response. When you have the opportunity to be persecuted, he's telling us, man, you need to leap for joy. That's a, a pretty crazy idea. Maybe you've heard this expression before. I, I think I've used it in a sermon at some point. Maybe it's just me talking to me, my kids. I don't know. But you, the expression is this. 10% of life is what happens to you. And 90% of life is how you respond to it. Now, I don't know where that originates. And I don't know if it's exactly scientific. But here's the big idea that I actually do agree with. Is that how we respond to what happens to us matters. It's noticed it has an impact. That's why he's telling them to be rejoice and be glad. It's not an internal deal, but the rejoicing is an external, it's a verbal celebration. I was thinking about this text this week. I was uh, thought back to in Acts chapter 16 when uh, Paul and Silas uh, were imprisoned after healing someone, when they were thrown in the, uh, the shackles, when they're there. And in the middle of the night after being whipped and tormented and miserable, hanging by their, most likely hanging by their ankles, they're known for singing and praising God and praying. And, and it, it was a, a, a whole worship concert. And if you remember the story, that's when God's power Power is unleashed. There's a there's an earthquake. They're set free, and in response to it, they stay and stick around even when they had their freedom. In response to that, you see a jailer and his entire family, most likely the prisoners, the prison guards. There's a massive revival. You see, when we actually draw the line. When we hold firm, when we stay the course despite persecution, God does some power, powerful things in that. And he promises in response to that, your reward 
is great in heaven. Your reward is great in heaven. Here's the thing. The longer I teach God's word, the more I, I, I realize I'm blown away with how often scripture speaks of this reality. And there's a reward system in place. We have a God that notices when we speak up on his behalf. We have a God that, that notices when we uh, speak up on behalf of the helpless, those who are created in his image that can't defend themselves. We have a God that takes note and there's a reward system in place. Now, some of us get a little bit awkward about that idea, but man, you can't spend much time in scripture without realizing that the things that we do in this life are either gonna have reward or not reward. You can have a life that's having an impact on lives, a response to things in an appropriate God-honoring way that, man, he's saying, listen, I notice and I'm going to reward you for that. There's nothing wrong with being excited about that and even being in pursuit of that. And he s explains, he says, listen, and you're in good company. I like thinking about this last section, he says, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Man, how, how cool to be in that company, to be along and consider like, hey, you're much like the prophets that when you're experiencing persecution, when you're being made fun of, when you're being mocked, when you're being excluded, when you're, someone's talking about behind your back, you're like, man, I, I'm in good company here. I'm like the prophets that came before me. What an awesome thing. What an awesome privilege to be a part of that. Because if we're honest with ourselves, this whole thing, is going to be done in a blink of an eye. So, how do we respond to this? I was just wrestling through just how this whole conversation about per, uh, persecution, and I've always wondered if the reason we aren't persecuted is because we've settled for a, a safe, a risk-free version of Christianity. A version of Christianity where we just kind of blend in, where we don't speak up about our faith. We hesitate to share even with the people that we're around every day, the, our coworkers, those closest to us, our family members. You're just like, maybe the reason we're not experiencing or colliding with the culture to that degree is because, man, we're camouflaged in. We're just blending in with our surroundings. So how does that change? How do we flip the switch on that? I jotted down on just a couple ideas of just practical application. I think all of them fall under the umbrella of being more risk takers in our life. I jotted down three just practical ways that we can be more risk takers. I think one of the best ways for engaging the world is asking more leading questions with the people you're around. Realizing, hey, I've got this limited window to engage with this person. Are there some things that I can ask that's going to move them to talking about spiritual things? Things that are lasting, things that are eternal. Lunch, I had lunch a couple of weeks ago with a, a friend that I've made at the, at the gym and was just talking with him in the entire conversation. I was just looking for opportunities. One, I care about him. I'm asking about his life, but I was really hoping to move towards spiritual things. And I finally got to the point of uh, talking about his, the loss of his father and talking about life in general and big picture stuff by question after question, got to share with him just a, a, a bit. He wasn't super receptive, just a bit about really what I believe this life comes down to is how we receive respond to Jesus Christ? What do we do with the offer that he's extended to each one of us? So often that comes from the mastery of asking questions. Practice it a bit. Take some risks. How, how can you move a conversation? How can you ask questions that are going to provoke thought? Second risk-taking thing I s jotted down is look for opportunities just to bring up spiritual things. Not, not to ask more questions, just like you're looking for in the weave and flow of the conversation or where you're at as you're interacting. How can you present, how can you move the conversation to talk about spiritual things? A friend of mine's in our current life group is kind of uh, interesting hearing his story. It's kind of a, a tragic thing with his uh, brother who's fairly young that just recently uh, was dying from cancer. And he, he's opportunity. I said, man, take a, take a chance. Try to get a sense of where he's at spiritually, man. You might have a very limited window with this. And he came back and he had done such a great job. I'm so encouraged with his response. He said, man, I brought it up. I wanted to check in. I wanted to know where you're at with Jesus. If that's something you've uh, decided 
decision that you've made. And thank the Lord is a really encouraging report that he had made the decision to embrace Jesus Christ. He is good in that area. And so he's so thankful after he passed, as tragic as that is, to be able to look back and be like, you know what? I was bold. I took a risk. I don't know, maybe somebody in our audience right now that's listening has somebody that they care about deeply. That's maybe their health is failing. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's an aunt or an uncle. Somebody that you're like, man, my time with them is short. I would suggest, man, take the risk. You want to have regret-free living. You want to make sure that you've taken and seized every opportunity to proclaim Christ. One other one that I just jotted down, and I'm sure you could add to our list, as I put down, put your flag up online so nobody wonders where you stand. What do I mean, put your flag up online? Man, if you get on your Facebook page or your Instagram or whatever it is, whatever social media, there should be, it should be splashed with things that point to Jesus Christ. Whether you're sharing a favorite verse, whether you're sharing a a picture with your family at ABF for Easter, whether you're sharing, uh, I don't know what it would be, maybe it's your most most recent TikTok Christian clip that you're like, or a sermon that you attach, or a song, Christian song that you like. Make sure that if somebody stumbles on one of your pages, they're not wondering what you believe, what you're holding to. And make sure that it's not peppered with politics. Utilize those opportunities, those platforms to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified. The one rescue that we have. It's interesting, I was online this last week and I'm trying to practice what I preach with that. And I have, even just on my Facebook, different things that point to this church, point to uh, my job, point to uh, different highlights that I think, different quotes, different things like that. It's interesting, I was dialoguing with a guy about some uh, wheels that I had for sale on online this past week and just dialoguing with him and he's just like, you know what? He's like, man, I, you seem like such a cool guy. I noticed on your Facebook that you're a pastor. And he said, man, are you open if I have some spiritual questions to be able to run them by you? Like this was without me having to say anything about it. Just proclaiming that my flag was up and nobody was wondering where I stand uh, on my faith. And so it led to a great conversation. I'm actually really excited to see what that uh, new friendship might unfold and have opportunity for. These are basically, this is basically it to understand That if you want to avoid persecution, we all know the way in order to do that. Be silent about your faith. Don't ever proclaim it. Be a a secret agent Christian. But if you want to experience life to the full, blessing, impact, influence, redirecting eternities, I'll tell you what, take more risks. Nobody gets to the end of their life and says, you know what, I I wish I wouldn't have taken so many risks for Jesus Christ. I don't think that's ever going to be a statement that's said. Well, this is the caution. Don't be surprised by it, but instead rejoice in it because we know that on the other side of this is the eternal kingdom, the kingdom that we're placing and betting our hope in. Let me pray as I wrap up. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this chance to be exposed to expectations as for someone that's committed to living right in a world that's going the exact opposite direction. We shouldn't be shocked that when we're trying to swim the opposite way that we're colliding with a culture that is not interested in that, that resists that idea. But I thank you for the promise that you will draw close that you will will reward, that you will bless, that you will fulfill, that these crossroads that we come to that are difficult, where we either wave our flag or we hide and are silent, God, that those are opportunities to verify, to solidify where we actually stand, what we actually cling to. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Jesus Christ that allows the rescue that we've experienced. We praise you in his name. Amen.